These days, you can't move on the internet without stumbling over a spoiler cast, theory videos and online conversations about your latest favourite TV show. So it's hard to believe that as recently as 2004, people simply just watched television and then, at best, spoke about it within their close circles the next day. But in 2004, with the rise of new technology and pioneering ideas, a mysterious new hit show for ABC changed the game. It altered the landscape in how we, as fans, engaged with our favourite series. I knew from the pilot that it was definitely going to be something special. It's definitely set the tone for the shows that came after it. Out of everything I've been a geek about, uh, nothing has reached the level that kind of Lost presented to us fans back then. This is a story of how the hit TV show Lost changed the way we watch television forever. Leave until he knows where he's going. Despite the enormous budget, at the time the most expensive pilot ever shot, and the uniquely diverse cast, Lost, the show about survivors of a plane crash on a mysterious island, arrived on television in a very traditional sense. The rollout of episodes followed the pattern of the long established televisual format, dropping weekly episodes with little more than conventional advertising spaces to promote the next instalment. But something else was percolating in the media world a new medium of entertainment that was in its infancy, ready to birth a new form of fan conversation and interaction for a worldwide audience. Podcasts. For some reason I had a subscription to USA Today, like that was like one of the newspapers I had. And in, uh, I think it was that summer, summer of 05, they ha uh, had an article about this new thing called podcasting. Oh, it's like a blog, but it's an audio blog. This is so cool. I had, I had no idea what a podcast was. Jay and Jack were huge fans of Lost, but were mostly limited to discussing their theories with each other. But the birth of podcasting presented a unique opportunity to create something not only by fans, but for fans. I really want to do something with Jack, who's, who's my dad. I always thought he was a really funny personality, so I was like, we need to do something with you like on the forefront. But we kind of tossed around ideas a lot, and then it was in that moment of us just like really being into talking about it. I was like, oh my God, we could talk about the show and it would be like a forum, but alive. Like you hear people talking about it the same way you'd be typing in an online forum. Podcasting was extremely new at the time, with a lot of creators still trying to understand what form it could and would take. But the obvious initial comparison was simple. Podcasts would be a very niche, modern take on a radio show. Actually, that's how he explained it to me. In radio back then, conversations didn't happen about like niche topics the way you would in a forum. What we were able to do with Lost was be able to kind of talk like a talk show, but about these more niche topics like you would find when you would go in a forum on some topic that you're really passionate about. It was much more about the conversation about the show and like, oh, hey, did you see this Easter egg? Or what about this scene? Let's talk about that. And I think that was much more what it was as opposed to a review of the episode. Like Lost, podcasting began to explode in popularity, the show and the format proving to be a match made in heaven. Dozens of fan podcasts dedicated to combing through the latest episodes began to arrive, and this movement was quickly noticed by Lost's official channels. Spotting a new tool to promote their weekly episodes, the show's creators created the official Lost podcast in November of 2005. It was just the perfect show for a podcast because people, you know, after you watch the show, you're like going, okay, I got to find out what, you know, what is the smoke monster? What is this? You know, I need to get those answers. Lost presented the perfect vehicle for the podcasting world to hitch its ride on, even beyond an avenue to discuss the mysteries the fans were eager to solve. It was a show that people like, you know, shippers, you remember shippers, like people that were like into the relationships, they had their stuff in this show. You had the um, sci-fi element. You had the Easter eggs, theories, and all that kind of stuff element. Like it had all these different angles. So you had all these different things that you want to talk about. And it was still a network TV show. So, you know, it was weekly. You had a whole week in between each episode. So that's a lot of time for a show like that to kind of percolate ideas, and kind of think and theorize and really kind of dig into every little nitty gritty minute detail that in the modern world, especially with streaming, were a lot do it you get it all at once or even still like disney plus or whatever it's week to week to week there's no big breaks the show had become a phenomenal success and with that bred a desire for information about this mysterious island and our survivors so in an effort to uniquely deliver on this salacious desire the showrunners looked to another media platform you needed all of them and they needed you 
In 2006, Ubisoft announced that it licensed the rights and begun production on a Lost video game, later revealed to be Lost via Domus. Unlike other video games based on television shows of its era though, the Lost video game would be a true companion piece to the show, contributing towards its lore and, ultimately, serving the audience's desire to find out more information about the mysterious island. At the beginning of development though, how to achieve that vision was a little hazy. My idea, stupidly, was I want to make a shooter based on the Dharma Initiative because no one knows what the Dharma Initiative was. Uh, and I thought it would be a really cool mystery and make a really cool shooting where maybe we could go into some of the areas of uh, the island and I could leverage some of the Far Cry engine technology in the lush islands because it was a no brainer, right? But it was really shot down because, you know, we really needed to be true to the show and we were afraid that the audience wouldn't really appreciate that type of angle as well. The showrunner's vision for the game was simple. This was to be a companion piece for fans of the show to learn more. The decision was then made to run the game's plot alongside and entwined with the events of the first 70 days of the show's story. We created a character that was on the plane and then we walked, we built through the eyes of this character as another point of view in the plane crash and surviving the island. The audience of Lost is very finicky and it has to be exact. So it was not even a, a question that we were going to do a spin-off character, but exactly living the story of the actual show. Lost production company Bad Robot was heavily invested in this idea, working closely with Ubisoft to make sure everything was perfectly aligned. From a tourist perspective, they were very, very informative. We spent a lot of time massaging the story with them. What was good about them is that they allowed us to use whatever we wanted to create the experience for the audience, which I think also as they were evolving with the audience in the show, they also evolved the story because they also picked stuff from us, we picked stuff from them. So it was a really true collaborative uh, experience. I really enjoyed it. In 2021, the idea of weaving a narrative through different forms of storytelling is very commonplace. It's part of the foundation of the Marvel Cinematic Universe. But in 2006, the idea of stretching your plot over several mediums in a primitive version of today's popularized metaverse strategy seemed like a risky proposition. Everyone keeps bringing up metaverse, metaverse and all these things, but you know, we were making metaverses when we made the lost video game with all the different elements attached to it. To me, it was more content that was related to the experience for you to grow with the, with the product, not just like supplementary content to get you engaged to come spend more money more into the platform. With detailed podcasts, webisodes, and a video game, Lost was truly pioneering the approach to engaging an audience outside of the television screen. But the show's creators had another trick up their sleeve, one that would fuse the digital and real world experience of watching Lost. It was a dream, but it was the most real thing I've ever experienced. The Lost Experience was an alternate reality game, or ARG, that took place between season two and three, with more following after its success. It engaged fans during the off-season break, sending them further down the rabbit hole of mysteries the show had presented. But what exactly is an ARG? So it's something that exists in the real world. So you're looking for real life clues, real life puzzles. It's spotting things in the real world that other people who aren't playing the game might just walk by. Cynically, an ARG can be viewed as a modern marketing tool, capitalising on the most dedicated fans to comb through hints and puzzles teased in other marketing materials, and then subsequently chasing the rabbit to the next clue. This all leads to, hopefully, a satisfying lore drop that you wouldn't get by simply just watching the show. That was the first time that I'd ever seen anything quite like it. I knew that something was up the minute I saw the advert in amongst all the normal adverts for Oceanic Airlines. Oceanic Airlines. In the air since 1979. Oceanic Airlines. 30 years with a perfect safety record. Oceanic Airlines. Oceanic Airlines. The Lost Experience was almost like a modern version of a treasure hunt. Clues were sprinkled throughout official merchandise and website links buried in fake adverts that sent fans further into the abyss. Clues were hidden in magazines, built into the show's comic con panels, and even on the side of Apollo bars, real world recreations of the show's fictional candy bars being sold in stores. These breadcrumbs offered promise of knowledge to those seeking answers about the Hanzo Foundation, the fictional shadowy company behind the show's mysterious Dharma initiative. And so you got, went to the Apollo website, you found all these different clues and they said that they were going to be doing a limited edition of these chocolate bars in certain cities around the world. So at the time of getting these, we didn't know what they were actually for. I just stuck mine in my bag thinking I've got this cool item, you know, I'm going to take it home and keep it. And then I heard someone shouting out, 
open them up, open them up. You won't believe what's inside. And so I actually opened one of them at the time. And there it was, there was this website. The Lost ARG provided a supplementary television experience like no other, captivating fans by leveraging the latest ideas and ultimately keeping fans engaged and talking about the show. My favorite thing about this show is mystery. And you know, the fact that these clues were sprinkled around that directly led to certain aspects of the show, it was just too intriguing not, not to go ahead and do. And what we have to also remember is this, is this existed at a time before social media as we know it. So there wasn't any YouTube, there wasn't any Facebook, there wasn't any Instagram. It was literally just people on forums going to actual web pages to discuss what they had found. The obtuse and mysterious nature of the Lost experience felt incredibly on brand for the show. Along with the other companion pieces of media, it only helped keep Lost in the cultural zeitgeist and bring together a passionate community. It really did embed me in the show. It made me so much more intrigued and interested in other people, so much more so that I'd be recording it from the television just to re-watch the episodes over and over again, or even slow bits down to try and find more clues. So it really did heighten the show's experience. But if we can't live together, we're gonna die alone. With every piece of supplementary media, the Lost fan base spread further and grew more passionate. And now, with modern means to share, discuss and explore the show's ideas, a fan base like no other began to emerge. It was just people really happy and willing to share information. And like I say, this is from all over the world. So even when someone would write on the forums, they'd be speaking in their own language and we would have to pull it through a very early version of what we would now call Google Translate. It was the internet before the internet existed. And I didn't realize how close anyone could really be just through those wires, through that internet line. Most importantly though, and perhaps unlike other shows, this time it felt like the show's creators were actually listening to a passionate fan base. N Nikki and Paula were a case in point example, right? They brought exactly. them on, everybody hated them. You always whine about not being included, now's your chance. Which again is like almost commonplace now, every time some fan franchise adds some new character, there's always backlash. It was one where it's just like, no, I was like, why, why'd you do this and blah, blah, blah. And I think they had good intentions for it. And I understand the concept behind it, but it wasn't taking. And, you know, they were reading comments about it as it was happening on the podcast. And so clearly there was the pivot. And, but the way they sent them off was such a nod and wink to the fans. It was one of those moments where you could see they were a part of it and you could sense that they were feeling the disdain of the characters. I think they even would quip jokes during the podcast at the time. And then they kind of switched and pivot and kind of killed off the characters, but in a really fun tongue in cheek way. We got to find out whatever we can about these Jabonis. Jabonis? Nina and Pablo. Dude, show some respect. You know their names, it's Nikki and Paolo. Fans, for the first time, felt like they truly had a voice. And if they were loud and united enough, could even influence decisions. It's something that seems less of a foreign concept these days in the era of Snyder Cuts and online petitions, but back then, it was something new. But that's what's neat is, they, they look to the fans as a bit of that source of truth, like almost the the, the smell test, like is this, is this pass, is this check? Whereas as now, like it's almost, I don't know, it's just so, it doesn't doesn't all, always necessarily work because I feel like Last Jedi to The Rise of Skywalker is an example of, there was a lot of pushback to Last Jedi. They clearly did a whole bunch of like trying to pivot to what they wanted and I think it almost made it a lesser product. So it doesn't always necessarily work, but I thought in that sense, I thought they did a really good job of pivoting and adjusting to and they, they probably saw like, hey, wait, this we try this didn't work, let's move to something else. I see you in another life, brother. Despite Lost being a multimedia pioneer, incorporating all the latest digital forms it could find to stretch the viewing experience, it also surprisingly, and passionately, clung onto the last intrinsic staple of broadcast television. Along with a few of its contemporaries, such as Game of Thrones, Lost would be one of the last bastions for something we'd accepted as part of the furniture for a very long time. Appointment viewing. The reality is what I call is that we want things instantly. You know, that's why everything now is on demand. And if it's not now and it's not today, we're gonna lose, lose the attention span. You have to have that space to be able to, to kind of have that level of engagement and interaction. And I think there's shows that I think rise to that level of loss, but I, it doesn't have that space and it doesn't have that need to fill in that space. 
So I think there are things that are like appointment TV, but even like the Disney Plus stuff or I think Amazon does week to week to week. You kind of still watch it at your own time. Uh, you can't put the toothpaste back in the, the tube on that one. Yeah, this, the streaming aspect really hurts the, because uh, we've done other TV shows and we've done, we we do Stranger Things, but it's, it's not the same because, you know, some people are ahead of where we're talking about. Mm -hmm. You know, so it, it, it kind of hurts. But I've looked into the eye of this island and what I saw was beautiful. Lost was clearly a product of its time, hitting a very sweet spot in televisual history. It rode the final wave of appointment television while simultaneously launching and co-opting modern media and marketing ideas. And despite its extremely divisive conclusion, it was a huge success on all fronts. But arguably, it might not have worked as well in any other time period of entertainment history. It needed to exist in this particular pocket of time to not only have the option to pioneer these ideas, but also the opportunity to truly capitalize on them. I think to me, it's definitely set the tone for the shows that came after it. From a story story perspective, it really dictated a lot what the future of not just TV shows, but what gaming storytelling was about as well too. So I, I think it really is something that we should definitely remember. Like it's to me, the way they told the story was just genius. Lost techniques molded a fan base like no other. The community was cultivated not only through the contents of the show, but how it nurtured its audience in the gaps. So much so that it built to a crescendo that inevitably was always going to disappoint a large portion of the rabid fan base. Hardcore fans desperate for answers they'd been craving for six uninterrupted years. When the finale happened, there definitely was more negativity and stuff like that as a part of it. But while it was happening, it was one of the coolest communities to be in you know jack and i we did a lost panel we've still done well pandemic aside we've yeah. done panels on lost at comic con but like we do that lost panel now and people are coming that didn't watch it while it aired and like stream it and just kind of watch it straight through and i feel bad for those people because like so much of the experience of lost was the the yeah. honor and, and and having that conversation and, and lifetime friendships the people that i consider family from you know those those relationships built out of those fan communities we still meet up once a year we invite a bunch of people to my house from those communities and again from people driving from all over the united states people friends that i made for over decades now of friendships from all different walks of life because of that show despite your lasting impression of lost there's no disputing its legacy what began life as premium television in the most traditional form evolved the landscape so much that we've never watched television in the same way again. It grew and vocalized fan-driven content, drew the blueprints for modern marketing tools, and pioneered cross-media storytelling. Lost was a show that spent the entire six-year run adjusting the formula for how a television show could thrive, paving the way for shows and fandoms that followed. And despite finishing its run in 2010, its legacy will be felt for decades to come. And, as Jacob once said, it only ends once. Anything that happens before that is just progress.